I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. We are here on another Monday, and I apologize for us dropping the ball last Monday. We just really got crunched in our schedule. Uh, we had some things catch up to us, and we dropped the ball on the Mail Call Mondays. We just didn't have enough time left uh, to try to get it edited, uploaded, and do all that fun stuff. So instead, this Monday, we're answering some questions from last Monday. So I hope you guys are cool with that. And let's get on with the questions. Our first question comes from Andrew. And Andrew asks, I have a Remington 700 26 inch barrel. I'm thinking of betting the action. Is it possible to mimic a 20 or 22 inch barrel by extending the bedding four to six inches beyond where the barrel is threaded in? Thanks for the videos. Well, Andrew, what you really have to do is you have to step back and you have to think about why guys go with a shorter barrel on a precision rifle. And the primary reason they go with a shorter barrel is because they want a more compact package. Um, you're not going to get that just by extending the bedding pad underneath the chamber. I think what you're trying to do is you're thinking about uh, getting more rigidity out of the barrel and extending that out. And I would suggest not doing that on a lighter weight factory Remington 700 barrel. Uh, really what you see when guys are extending that bedding pad out is when they have a really heavy barrel and they're trying to support it a little bit better. Um, really, I, I would keep that bedding pad back and go just slightly uh, in front of the recoil lug and not worry about trying to extend it out too far. If you really want the uh, benefits of a 20 or 22 inch barrel, then just hack your 26 inch barrel back to uh, 20 or 22 inches. Now, when I say hack it back, I say take it to a gunsmith that can throw it in a lathe and cut it back and put a correct chamber and crown on it. And what you may actually see is you may see an increase in accuracy doing that because first of all, you're getting a fresh crown on that barrel. Sometimes the ones from Remington aren't absolutely perfect. And you're also getting that shorter barrel so you're getting a little bit more rigid system. So don't go with an extended uh, bedding pad underneath the chamber. Uh, just cut it back or just leave it be. Our next question comes from Ted. Ted asks, when starting with a new gun and caliber, how's the best way to find the right bullet? Start with one manufacturer and try different weights or find the right weight and then try other manufacturers in that same weight. Or select a weight and try different manufacturers of that weight to find the right manufacturer. Then go back and try weights within that manufacturer. Okay, Ted, that question kind of made my head hurt a little bit. Really, when we're trying to determine what type of bullet to shoot through our rifle, we need to start with the rifling in the barrel. We need to determine what the twist is in the rifling, and then from knowing the twist rate, we can determine which bullet we want to go with. Now, we will take the shortcut very often and we'll just say weight. We'll use the barrel twist to determine what weight bullet we want to go with, but really it's not the weight that we're using the twist to determine. It's the length of the bullet. Now, as a rule of thumb, longer bullets tend to be heavier. So guys just take the shortcut and say with a faster twist, you want a heavier bullet. But a faster twist wants a longer bullet. Longer bullets are generally heavier bullets. There are some exceptions in there, uh, but that's the good rule of thumb. So you use your barrel twist to determine the length of bullet. The length of bullet determines what weight you need. Once you know what weight bullet you need for that barrel, then you can go to different barrel manufacturers and you can select their match bullets. And then you need to test those through your rifle to see which one performs the best. And you can balance other things in, which one you know is more cost effective than another, uh, which one performs better on certain game or certain uh, yardages, uh, and then go from there. Um, or you can take the shortcut and you can just go on the internet and you can see uh, what the guys that are winning matches are using for that particular caliber or that particular barrel twist. Uh, so that's a really good shortcut. But I don't really bounce back and forth between bullets and manufacturers and that. Uh, the key manufacturers that I use are Sierra, Hornady, and Lapua. And to a lesser extent, uh, Nussler has their custom competition line, which they've got some good bullets in there. 
but those are generally stuff that I use for practice or uh, like in an AR, I'll use Nosler Custom Competitions because their 69 grain bullet is very comparable to the Sierra Match King uh, 69 grain for the uh, AR. But when we're talking about uh, my match rifles that I'm actually going to big matches with, I stick with Hornady or Sierra or Lapua. Uh, those three will give you very good performance. So figure out what your weight is and then try out the match bullets in those ranges. Uh, Berger also makes some very, very nice bullets, but they tend to be in the upper end of the price spectrum. So we don't use those a whole lot. But again, good options to try out. Just pick a 100 round box of each one and give them a go through your rifle and see which you like the best. Our next question comes from Matt. Matt says, I have a Remington 700 and 22 250 that I've shot the barrel out. Good job. I want to replace it with a 308 barrel. What are some good brands? I don't want to go cheap, but not nuts either. Also, what's your preferred twist rate? Well, really, I would suggest going with uh, Bartland barrels. Uh, they're a really good uh, performer. We've had some good luck with them here. A lot of the guys in our club shoot them and they perform very well. Uh, Rock Creek also has some good barrels out there. Krieger uh, is also a good barrel. We've run that on the, the 243 and it's performed very well. What I generally recommend though is pick the smith that you want to do the work and ask him what he recommends because there's a really good chance that he has had a bunch of those barrels through or he has a relationship with a barrel manufacturer or he may have barrels in stock and uh, that all will help you out there uh, as far as the twist rate for a 308 anything between 1 in 12 and 1 in 10 is going to work well for the bullets that we use for long range shooting um, I have rifles in 1 and 12 twist that perform excellent with 175 and 178 grain bullets. Uh, I think when you're starting to get into 1 in 10, you're starting to twist them a little bit faster than necessary and you're losing a little bit of velocity. So really my preference would be in the 1 in 12 to 1 in 11 and a quarter, um, somewhere in there for a rebarrel on a 308 that you're going to use for uh, long range precision. Now if you're going to use something with more subsonic loads or you're going to mess around with a the suppressor, then you may want to look at the 1 in 10 because then you can spin heavier bullets and you can run them slower and still stabilize them well. So uh, give that some consideration. Our next question comes from Mike. Mike asks, will the gases exiting a muzzle brake really damage a windshield if firing across a hood, particularly with a magnum caliber? Well, Mike, uh, the answer is it really depends. Uh, some rifles and some brakes are a little bit more vicious than other rifles and brakes, and it depends upon what angle you're at. Um, I don't see you shattering a windshield with a muzzle brake. Uh, you can crack that windshield because of the pressure wave coming off of it. And it's really going to depend. I can tell you that I have never broken a windshield with a 308 even firing inside a vehicle uh, where that pressure is really contained. Uh, but I've also never tried a 50 BMG or a 338 across the hood of a car uh, because there's really a great potential to damage the, the vehicle, damage the windshield. Um, there's also the possibility that you're going to kick up any kind of uh, debris that may be laying on the hood or maybe floating around and uh, that may cause you some problems and you never know that may be the time that you uh, knock loose a piece of carbon out of that brake and that carbon slams into the windshield and causes problems. So if it's anything you care about then I would say make sure you're well away from that windshield or if you have to shoot across a hood uh, throw a moving blanket or something across the windshield just to give it a little bit of added protection. Uh, if you're shooting on a match or it's a you know beat up range truck or something uh, who cares shoot away and don't worry about it but from my experience you have to be really close and uh, you really have to do something stupid to bust a windshield until you get into the extreme long range caliber rifles and then they've just got a massive amount of blast coming off there and you're probably going to mess something up our next question comes from larry what are the bags attached to the arms of the competition shooters designed to do 
Well, Larry, we actually did a short little article on uh, some of the WeBad bags. I've used now the Pump Pillow and the Todd Tack Pack. Uh, the Pump Pillow is the larger of the two. And what those bags basically do is they take up empty space uh, in your shooting position. They're more for shooting off of barricades and uh, shooting off of improvised shooting positions uh, than they are for prone shooting. Now in prone shooting you can use them like you would a backpack or something just to throw the rifle across the top of them. Uh, sometimes uh, guys will slip the fore end of the rifle through the straps in the bag and then drop that on barricades or various different shooting obstacles. But the main deal is to be able to slide it on your arm and then that bag helps take up the space between your arm and your raised leg to help support the rifle a little bit better. At least that's how I use it. Uh, the big benefit of these bags is the, uh, the utility of them is limited only to your imagination. So really whatever you can come up with, uh, they can help you out. A lot of shooters, myself included, have started carrying a couple of different sizes of bags to matches with us. That way we can tailor whichever bag we need uh, to the shooting problem at hand. And it's really gaming it. Uh, I wouldn't carry multiple bags out to the field if I was deploying as a LE sniper. I'd probably just pick the smaller one and roll with that. But you know, from competition standpoint, any advantage you can get helps. And if you're just carrying around a relatively lightweight bag, there's no reason not to. We'll go ahead and post a link to that write-up that we did down in the description below. So if you want to go read a little bit more about the WeBad bags, then check it out on our website. Robert asks, what's up with everyone weaving bungee cord through your quad rail? Well, Robert, there is a little bit of a good purpose for doing it, but I think what you're seeing a lot of guys doing it for is just to look cool and to try to imitate the operators. Uh, my rifle in front of me here, now this is my work rifle, it's what I carry out on patrol with me. I recently went through a little bit of a revamp on it. I added a uh, quad rail where before I was just running Mo handguards, uh, and that lets me run my light up front, and then I went ahead and put a hand stop here so that I can get a really good grip on it. And you'll notice that I do have a bungee cord wrapped around the uh, side of it here. Well, the reason for that bungee cord is because it allows me to roll my sling up and bungee my sling to the side of the rifle. Usually this rifle either sits in the trunk or uh, here lately we've been having a little bit of excitement. So um, when we have the high level likelihood of subject with a gun run or shots fired runs and that, then I throw this rifle up front with me. And this keeps the sling wrapped up and managed on the rifle, not catching on gear, radios, mics, computers, and all the other crap that's inside a police car. Uh, so keeping the sling managed is really important to be able to deploy the rifle quickly. Now with the sling rolled up like this, if I need to, then I can go ahead and grab the rifle and I can fight with it just like this with the sling wrapped up on it. I can still access all the controls on the rifle. I can still do everything I need to. However, if we get into a situation where I have the time, then I can just grab the sling, yank it out, unroll it, and throw it on. Now, I'm using a Magpul MS4 sling on here, so I, can, I usually keep it in single point mode when it's rolled up, mainly because it just stows easier that way. Uh, also, if I need to throw the sling on, then it's really quicker just to loop this over my head and be ready to go. Uh, if I get into a situation where things have slowed down, then I can go ahead and re-link the sling to where it needs to go on here and have a nice two-point sling that snugs that in close to my body. Uh, when I'm done, messing around, doing whatever we need to do, and I can go take the rifle back to the car and pack it up. Uh, then it is a fairly simple situation here to just snap the sling back together in single point mode, uh, wrap it up and re-bungee it, and we're good to go. And I can throw it in the back of the car, and again, that sling is ready to go for next time. And I don't have to worry about it getting tangled up on anything. It's always ready to go and where it needs to be. Uh, also guys that run racks in their cars, overhead racks, it allows them to keep the sling uh, rolled up and out of the way. It's not dangling down. It's not a safety hazard. It's not something that a prisoner in the back of the car can get a hold of. 
Uh, now on military rifles or guys that are deployed, uh, they are using the bungee either to route cabling through. If it's not like this, where I've just wrapped one piece of bungee, sometimes you'll see it weaved in and out, which I think is really what you're talking about. Um, you can use that to weave um, pressure pad cables for light switch cables, all kinds of other stuff through and not have it hanging off the rifle. So uh, there are really a multitude of uses, but it's mainly just to keep things compact and keep them from dangling off the rifle. Uh, it, again, it's one of those things that guys see it, looks kind of cool, so you're gonna start seeing a lot of imitators, uh, especially where there may not really be any uh, purpose for it. But like this, I went ahead and used a bungee because I've got this bungee cord laying around here. I've got a cord lock laying around here. Got a bunch of them here, there, and everywhere. But uh, if you're just a regular street officer, if you're not a high-speed, low-drag guy, then you know you can grab one of those fat rubber bands uh, that are always floating around or grab something off of uh, one of the blue rubber bands that they always stick on produce. And you can throw that around your forend and shoot your sling up underneath that. And it has the added benefit of if you rip on it real hard, uh, it's just going to snap and it's going to release your sling and uh, you're not going to have to worry about it and then later on you can just uh, go to office services and grab you another box of rubber bands and be good to go. So that's why I run a bungee on my sling. Uh, that's why you're starting to see bungees on some of the other rifles out there. So I hope that answers your question. Our next question comes from Steven. Steven asked, thoughts on new 7.62 by 51 Winchester new brass primed for precision rifles, bolt or auto loader. Well, Steven, I've had a lot of good luck with Winchester brass. I usually don't purchase it primed because I prefer to use federal match primers. And so I'll prime it myself with a Lee hand primer. And Lee hand primers are really not that expensive. So I'd suggest you go ahead and get one. You're gonna need, if you reload, you're gonna need to punch those primers out and put new primers in anyway. So go ahead and buying unprimed brass really isn't that big of a hassle. But Winchester brass, I find, especially for the 308, offers a really good mix of value and uh, quality. Uh, it's fairly high quality brass. We get quite a few firings out of it before I'm having any problems, before the primer pockets are loosening up. But yet it's not breaking the bank like Lapua brass would. So I suggest checking them out. I don't know if Winchester offers primed brass, but again, I suggest you just go ahead and uh, prime it yourself and save yourself a little bit of trouble. Add a mask, quad rail versus key mod for a fighting rifle. Well, Adam, I know uh, key mod is kind of the current hotness, uh, getting ready to be replaced by M-Lock, I think, for the, the guys that have to have the latest and greatest. But the reality is either of those or quad rails are going to work just fine. Uh, you'll notice that my rifle here has quad rails, but you will also notice that the vast majority of the rails are covered by rail protectors and they're not really doing a whole lot. Uh, they give me a little bit better purchase on the gun because I can wrap my fingers in the grooves on the rails, but uh, the actual rail real estate is not doing anything but adding a little bit of weight to the system. So something like a key mod rail where you don't have the rails where you don't need them and you can put rails where you do need them, or uh, you can just totally avoid the rail issue and you could put actual key mod accessories where you need them, uh, does have a really good benefit. Uh, we'll see going forward if the M-Lock rail system catches on and you end up with M-Lock accessories instead of just M-Lock rails. Uh, and maybe you'll be able to do the same thing. But the really nice thing about a good old fashioned quad rail handguard is you never forget where you put your rail sections. The rail sections never uh, go out of style. Uh, they never become unavailable. And on a system like we have here, which this is a Midwest Industries rail, uh, the rails are part of the handguard, so there's nothing to come loose. You don't have to worry about thermal expansion loosening things up. You don't have to worry about Loctite on all the different rail attachment points. Uh, so I think it's a little bit simpler system. So really, there are pros and cons to both sides. Uh, I've got this set up right now mainly because it was a good value. It does what I need it to do. It's not super fancy, uh, but 
you know, I do have another rail system that has uh, key mod capability. I'll probably be getting another rail uh, for a future AR build here in the not too distant future that'll use the M-Lock system. Um, so, you know, we're pretty varied on uh, what we use here, but you really can't go wrong with any of the above. Uh, so the main thing is pick something that will work for you and then train with it and make sure that nothing's going to fall off, nothing's going to come loose, and that it works the way you expect it to. And then don't change it the next time the new hotness comes out. Stick with what works. You don't always have to dump money on uh, the new cool stuff just because it's new and cool. Sean asks, on your precision rifle rounds, do you batch your empty brass by weight? If so, what percentage of weight variation do you allow? I'm reloading for a 22250 and notice that out of 60 once fired Hornady brass, the weights vary between 148.6 and 153.4. Sized, deep primed, and trimmed. That's a 4.8 grain delta. Not sure if I should scrap the brass or just run with it. Uh, Sean, I just run with it. Uh, I do not weight sort any of my brass, even my match brass when I'm running Lapua or you know match brass when I'm running Winchester 308 brass. Uh, the only time that I'll actually go through and weight sort is if I'm using pickup or if I'm using uh, once fired that I've gotten from uh, some other source. Uh, then I may go through and weight sort just to make sure that I don't have a huge swing one way or the other. But for tactical rifle shooting, I really haven't found weight sorting to be a effective use of my time. Uh, you may get a very, very incremental increase in uh, consistency when you weight sort, but and not so much that it's going to cause me to miss a thousand yard target. So uh, I really think that I have a better use of my time elsewhere. If I was going to do anything, sort anything at all, then I would go through and I would sort my bullets by bearing surface, uh, and that would be about the only sorting. But really, uh, I don't sort anything like that. I try to keep my brass in uh, lots uh, the way I bought it and then I just roll with it from there. So I wouldn't waste your time weight sorting. Uh, just go ahead, load it up, and run with it. Zach asks, best 223 or 556 five, round for home defense and why? Well, Zach, there is a lot of good ammo out there for the AR for home defense. Now, this rifle right here, uh, it's loaded with our department-mandated ammunition, which is the Federal TRU-223E ammunition. Uh, that's a 55-grain hollow-point round. Uh, it fragments very quickly. It's not going to over-penetrate and go through other things. It's really a good round for close-in fighting. Now, if you're going to run into intermediate barriers, it's not a good round because it does fragment very quickly. Uh, there's a good chance that if you start trying to punch through car doors that it's going to fragment uh, and come out the other side of that interior door panel uh, as just dust. The TRU-223E is going to have enough energy to be able to get the job done, but it's really not going to have a great uh, possibility of penetrating through exterior walls and going on to cause damage down the street. So it's a really good option. However, I don't want you to think that choosing a low penetrating round is the end all. It's not the answer to all the problems. You still need to make sure that you're aware of your fields of fire. You need to know where friendlies are located and you need to make sure that you rehearse and you know which directions you're good in uh, shooting at and uh, keep that in mind. Uh, when it's all said and done, you want to make sure that you hit the target because if you're just spraying and praying and sending bullets into the wall, it's really not a good situation. Uh, something like this round, uh, there's very little chance that it is going to go completely through an attacker's body and continue on like you would if you really had the poor common sense to shoot something like an M855 round, uh, but it's going to get the job done. Uh, do not, do not, do not ever use something like uh, surplus green tip ammunition. That's the M855 round. It has a tungsten steel penetrator in it, and that is designed for maximum penetration in an AR. Uh, 
Uh, there's really no situation uh, inside a residential structure that I would want to be in shooting that round. Uh, there's not a whole lot inside a residence that is cover from a rifle round, uh, so you don't need maximum penetration when your uh, biggest problem is furniture and drywall. Uh, but the uh, there's a lot of good deals out there on M855, and I suspect there's a lot of guys out there uh, with their home defense rig loaded with green tip ammo. So just really don't do it. Uh, stick with something in the 55 to 69 grain range that is a hollow point or a ballistic tip frangible or fragmenting round. Uh, you don't necessarily want frangible ammo. Frangible ammo is compressed copper or a compressed copper alloy that fragments very quickly and frangible is usually not designed for defensive purposes. It's designed for close-in training on steel. But something like 55 grain hollow points work really well. When they're driven fast, they transfer a lot of energy to the target and they disintegrate quickly. They just don't punch through car sheet metal or glass well at all. So bear that in mind. Uh, lots of options out there. If you don't want to go through and you don't want to research and you don't want to try to figure it out, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the Hornady tap line that I really, really like. Uh, and the Federal TRU uh, line works really well. They've got a lot of good options for the AR in a defensive capacity. Our last question of the week comes from Jason. Jason asks, I recently switched from a 243 to a 308 caliber bolt action. Now I've got about 600 rounds of useless 243 brass. I've heard some people say that you can reform 243s into 308s. My question, should you? Keep up the great work. Well, Jason, thanks for the great comments. Um, to be short, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I'd go ahead and kick that brass down the road. I'd try to trade it off to somebody if it's still got some life left in it, or um, I'd just go ahead and scrap it out. Uh, you can neck 243 up to 308, but you're gonna run into issues. You're probably gonna end up having to turn the necks on them, and you're gonna put a lot of effort into brass that may be really close to the primer pockets giving up on you. So. I just really wouldn't do it. I wouldn't waste the time on it. I'd go ahead and kick it on down the road and I would go ahead and buy 308 brass. Again, Winchester brass is great. Norma and Lapua is also good brass, but uh, pick up new brass and don't worry about trying to mess with that 243 brass. Well, that's all we have for this week. Again, thank you guys for sticking with us. I apologize again for last week. Uh, hopefully you got something out of this week's show. If I didn't answer your question, I'm sorry. Go ahead and either repost it next week or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. Now, I know I went ahead and showed this rifle here uh, in a couple of the questions. If you guys want to know more information about this rifle, which is one of my work rifles, uh, go ahead and post a request down in our comment section. I'm not opposed to doing an overview of this rifle, but it's really outside of our Mail Call Monday's scope. I know we're starting to stretch out into some other stuff, but I don't mind going over the details of how I set this rifle up and why, but I'd prefer to do it in a separate video. So again, if you guys want to see that, post in the comment section down below and we'll get it done for you. If you've got any other questions or comments, comment section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you've liked this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It really helps us out. And until next week, get out and shoot!